All right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about uh, primarily digital photography, but um, if uh, after this is over, if you have any questions that uh, you don't want to ask on here, you can uh, find my information on the CAN website, or you can reach me through my website, which is posted here. Um, I'm going to divide this like into three sections. We're going to I want to talk a little bit about photographic equipment, primarily cameras for a little bit. In case anybody want, is planning on buying a digital camera this Christmas, uh, this is a very good time to buy uh, digital cameras, by the way. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and we'll talk a little about exposing images and then a little bit about photo composition which I'm interested to compare with what the, most of the people here are, are, are people who put ink or chalk or paint to canvas, and I'm interested to see how that compares to what you guys do. So today there's a, there's a, a pretty broad range of, uh, of digital equipment available, and most of us carry in our uh, pocket or purse a, uh, a communication device with a camera in it. Um, I don't know what the percentage is of people that take pictures with, uh, with digital, uh, with their camera phones, but it's, it's extremely high. Um, uh, th these, these cameras, especially today, are becoming much more sophisticated. The new iPhone and Android cameras are, uh, are pretty sophisticated with pretty sophisticated software. Um, other than that, we, we go to the small point and shoot digital cameras, uh, ultra compact, compact and larger sensor cameras. Uh, the sales of these cameras are kind of waning because of uh, the older generation that uh, still likes to carry around a camera on vacation, uh, reminiscent of their old uh, Kodak Instamatic cameras, uh, hesitate to, to use their camera phone or their camera their phone as a camera so uh although these are today very good cameras the sales of these are are kind of waning there is a bridge camera uh which is the uh uh which is, which is similar to a, a digital single lens reflex except it has a fixed lens a fixed zoom lens and for those people that want to move up a little bit to a camera that has a little bit more capabilities than the, the simple point and shoot or even their iPhone or, or Android phone, this would be a camera for them. From there, we go up to the digital single lens reflex cameras, which uh, most of the art photographers would be using. And I don't know what happened. Can you still see the screen? No. Is it no, back? Yep. Yeah. I don't know what happened, but uh, but anyway, uh, uh, we have uh, Pro and and Prosumer digital single lens reflex and the new mirrorless cameras, which are coming becoming very popular um, uh, uh, as a, a form of upper level photography. Um, the, the biggest question I'm asked is, uh, why should I buy a digital single lens reflex when I have this nifty thousand dollar iPhone to take pictures with? And um, the, the, the answer is pretty simple. It has to do with the size of the sensor. Um, if you have a 20 megapixel iPhone uh, camera and a 20 megapixel full frame digital single lens reflex camera, although they sound the same, the photo sites on those two sensors are completely different. You're packing 20 million photo sites onto a very small sensor compared to packing 20, mil 20 million uh, photo sites onto a larger sensor. This allows the, the larger sensor allows better photography and low light, better color rendition, um, and, and clearer, sharper photographs. The iPhone and phone camera, lens camera sensors are improving, 
and they're using software to compensate for a lot of this uh, difference in quality. But you still, to get the, the, the kind of images you want to blow up to 16 by 20, 20 by 40, you would still need a camera with a fairly large sensor. Uh, quickly, the, the difference today, uh, as I said, mirrorless cameras are coming onto the market and are, are, are making an impact. Um, the, the, the DSLR, you, 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 you create your, your image through the lens itself and it bounces off a mirror through a prism and then you see it through the eyepiece as the image you're gonna take a picture of. The upper level mirrorless cameras do away with the mirror obviously and, um, and you, you have a straight shot through your aperture and, and, and shutter to your photo sensor. There is an eyepiece, but it does not look through the, the lens itself. There are advantages and disadvantages to both these designs. Both of the upper level digital single lens reflex and the mirrorless are capable of shooting HD video also. And the mirrorless cameras work much better shooting video than, than the DSLRs. I'm not gonna bore you with uh, the problems that most people feel with uh, upper level cameras when they take a look at the back and the various menus and so forth. But um, once you understand the, the principles involved with an upper level camera, they're, they're pretty intuitive. And you have much more capabilities in doing art photography. Many people buy these types of cameras and they put it on the uh, auto, auto setting and leave it there, uh, which is fine. <laughs> uh, but you're wasting the capabilities of a, of a very high end computing system for, for taking photographs. And of course, there's a myriad of lenses for the digital single lens reflex and mirrorless cameras. Um, everything from fisheye wide angle lenses to thousand millimeter telephoto lenses. Um, the, the average photographer has anywhere from three to five lenses in his bag. Uh, I have five lenses that I use. I have a walk around 17 to uh, 17 to 70 Sigma zoom, which is a very nice lens. Uh, I can focus down to 10 inches. Uh, so I, you call it a walk around lens because you have it on your camera most of the time. I have an 80 to 200 zoom. I have a couple prime lenses, a 50 and 35 millimeter prime lens. And I have an 85 millimeter macro lens, which kind of covers the kind of work that I like to do in photography. Um, If, the, if there's any questions on camera equipment, uh, give me a shout now and I'll, or I'll go on to exposing the image next. If anybody has any, if anybody has any questions, uh, you'll have to unmute yourself because we have everybody muted right now so we can hear Tom. Okay, now once you've uh, purchased your fancy new camera this Christmas, uh, you, you wanna be able to use it. Um, th the key to any exposure is this exposure triangle. And there are three key uh, components to the exposure triangle. Uh, light sensitivity of the sensor, shutter speed and aperture. The sensor in a modern camera is an adjustable, has an adjustable sensitivity to light. In the old days, when you bought a roll of film for your film camera, you purchased, purchased it with a certain sensitivity to light. And you were stuck with that sensitivity for the entire roll of film. Today, we can adjust the sensor sensitivity so that we can uh, use the camera over a variety of light conditions. The lower the number, the uh, less sensitivity to light that the camera has. Uh, the uh, higher the number, the, the more sensitivity to light that the camera has. Each, each 
increase in number uh, increases the uh, the uh, light it, it coming to the sensor by one full stop, meaning it doubles the, the amount of light coming to the sensor. With, with everything, there's a penalty, of course, uh, and uh, the higher the sensitivity in the camera, we, we get what's called in film camera, we would call it film grain, but in uh, in digital photography, it would be referred to as noise. The, uh, the image becomes blotted or, or the colors become smudged in, in the image. Um, the modern sensors handle this much better than, than the old sensors, but you still will pay a penalty. As you go up in sensitivity, there will be more noise. Um, this is a little bit better view of the of, of how the ISO numbers go up and ISO refers to the International Standards Organization which which has come up with this uh, uh, method of measuring the sensitivity of these sensors. Um, moving on to uh, aperture which is probably the most misunderstood and misused portion of the uh, uh, exposure triangle uh, the aperture is that portion of the camera lens that opens and closes uh, when uh, when you are, are, are going to expose a picture. Uh, the numbers that you see here at the top of the slide are f-stop numbers and they to most people they look like gibberish. Um, one of the questions I'm always asked too is why do the numbers going up get larger but the but the aperture gets smaller. Um, what these are is fractions uh, based on the square root of two. I'm not going to bore you with math and science here but uh, what, what we're what we're seeing is uh, that these numbers represent the diameter and area of these apertures. So as you go up in these numbers you're reducing the amount of light coming through that aperture by half. Um, and it's all based on the uh, area of that opening, which is relative to the square root of two. Aperture uh, is obviously essential in exposing your, your image, getting enough light so you'd have a clear image. But aperture is also the main factor in depth of field in photography. So depth of field is that portion of the image that's in focus in front of the object you're focused on and behind the object. Keeping it simple, the larger the ap aperture, the smaller the depth of field. The smaller the aperture, the, the larger the depth of field. This is just one way of controlling the image and, and some of the effects of having uh, a soft background or a soft foreground in the image you're trying to shoot. This is a couple examples here. On the left is a picture of uh, falling water. And in, in this type of image, you wanna have a clear, um, image from foreground to background in the image. So you would have to, depending on your distance, obviously, from your subject, you would have to make sure you focus and set the proper aperture so that you get a clear image from foreground to background. On the right is an image where I wanted to control the depth of field to have some of the image out of focus so that you have a soft background where you have the flower in front to be in focus. And as the, as the image goes to the back of the, uh, of, of the, of the image of, of the file, that you see a, a softening of the image. So using your aperture, you control this kind of effect in photography. Uh, quickly, there are three ways basically to change that depth of field. You can, if you're a standard distance from the subject, you can change the aperture. If you, you still, again, using the same focal length, you can change the focus distance. 
or you can change the, the uh, focal length of the lens to change this aperture and this depth of field. Depth of field is critical in, in art photography. Uh, shutter speeds is the final portion of the triangle. Um, obviously, all blended together, you, you, you have to make an image that's clear and crisp. If you're shooting subjects that are moving, then you want to use a higher shutter speed. Um, I have shot some hummingbird pictures at one four thousandth of a second, and it still doesn't stop their wings. So um, my philosophy, personal philosophy in photography is motion is blur. So I tend to shoot most of my photographs at fairly high shutter speed. I try to compensate with aperture and ISO to get proper exposures. But you have to remember that it's, again, you're trading things off in that triangle to get a, a good photograph. There are a couple things that uh, pure physics that screw up uh, crisp uh, images in a camera. One of them is lens diffraction. Uh, many people confuse depth of field with a crisp image and they're two separate subjects. Think of this as a, as a stream of water coming to a small opening. And as the water passes through the small opening, it increases in velocity and there's turbulence at the edges of the opening. This translates into turbulent or ripples through the, the, the stream. Um, this happens with light as it passes through the aperture. So looking at getting crisp, clear photographs is a balance of making sure that you understand the principles of aperture and reflected light coming through a lens. The other big problem in digital photography and lenses especially is chromatic aberration. And this is, a, this is the, the fact that the light waves do not focus properly longitudinally along the uh, optical axis or transversely along the, the image plane. And we see this as discolorations or, or uh, blurriness, especially in the edges of photographs. Fortunately today, chromatic aberration can be corrected uh, almost uh, completely with uh, software. I'm sure there's lots of questions about making an image, <laughs> but uh, let, let's go into uh, pho photo composition. Um, uh, Tom? Yep. Uh, we had a, a question here uh, okay. from Elmer asking uh, if you could put up the original triangle again. Yep. Thanks. Is there a question on it? No, thanks, Tom. I just wanted to see how that all related to what you finished with. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the sides of the triangle are, are uh, or the three parts of the triangle are all essential and it's a balancing act between these three things to make a decent photograph. Well, now let's talk briefly about uh, the art of photography. Uh, now that you have your camera and you understand about uh, making a good image, uh, in the old days with film, we used to talk about making a good negative. But uh, today it's uh, a little easier with uh, digital photography. Um, I have a great dark room here in my computer and uh, I can do a lot of, lot of things that I couldn't do before. But uh, photography is, um, is, is made up of, of the kind of visual elements and compositional elements and design elements that, that I think a lot of the people in here who paint or sketch or draw use the same kind of things when they're approaching their work. Um, the use of light and shadow and, and, and focus and space um, 
line, shape, texture, pattern. These are the kind of things that a photographer looks for when they're, when they're going to take an image. Uh, there are seven basic elements uh, of, uh, of photography, line, shape, form, texture, pattern, color, and space. Uh, all of these blend to, to the eye of a photographer in producing an image. A painter paints a scene and it may take a, an hour or two. A photographer shoots the same scene in a millisecond but the same compositional elements apply. Um, this is a, uh, this is a natural light uh, 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 image that I made uh, a couple years ago, but again, it brings into play the kind of elements that you want to see in a, in a portrait, for example. Uh, you have, you have light, dark textural elements that you want to bring into the photograph, the, the texture of her hair, the highlights, the, the line of her hand up at, by the side of her head. Uh, the background is, is softly blurred rather than being in focus. So these are all the kind of compositional elements that you have to think about when you're trying to make a, a photograph. But there's one key element that, that drives compositional photography uh, more than any, and it's called the rule of thirds. Does anybody know what the rule of thirds is? Painters, or anybody know what the rule of thirds is? Well, if you don't see it here, you'll see it here. The rule of thirds is putting a, a, a grid on your photograph with uh, nine segments. And part of your composition or the main part of your composition should line up along this one of these grids. This, um, th this naturally, this gives you a natural composition that is aesthetically pleasing in, uh, in, in photography. Um, you, um, you, you try to make the photograph uh, a, a naturally and aesthetic pleasing to the normal viewer. Um, I'll go back. If you were to just look at that photograph, and if you think it's pleasing, I hope you do, <laughs> uh, um, you, um, you, you, you really don't, under, don't know or understand that, that the that, that, that there is a guide that I'm using as a photographer to kind of construct that photograph. Uh, the amazing thing today, there are viewfinders for digital cameras that will put this grid in your viewfinder for you so that you can actually construct, uh, for those who, who don't have a natural tendency to do it, can, can construct this right, right in their viewfinder. Again, this is a black and white photography. We're talking about texture and uh, light and dark. And in black and white photography, especially, the picture should be in black and white, not shades of gray. And here we have a lot of construction elements. The foreground is out of focus. The star of the show is the welder himself with the light from his torch shining on his face mask. Uh, the, the, the folds of his shirt, everything uh, wanted to be in this crisp uh, black and white mode. But guess what? The rule of thirds applies here too. And uh, uh, again, constructing the image with the main star of the image along these axis in this grid. Um, this is a this is a compositional element that brings into play uh, a, a couple different rules. There's like a one-third, two-thirds rule for horizon and sky. Uh, uh, it, uh, there's a uh, there's an uh, an epi uh, 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 there's a um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for uh, a compositional element where you have 
elements of your photograph in two dimensional silhouettes. The, the, the buoy and the, and the sailboat are almost completely in silhouette, although we're getting some light off the, uh, off the boat. The, uh, the sunlight glinting off the ocean, pattern, texture in the photograph, the, the clear blue sky above. Um, digital photography is pretty funny. Uh, on a monitor here, I can see um, more color than I would in a standard print, for example, an actual physical print. So uh, you, you see these kind of elements in design. But guess what? It's again, the rule of thirds is in play. Also in this is, is a compositional call, element called space. This has a positive space in this, in this photograph. Um, if, if someone would have taken this photograph other than myself, for example, would they have put the sailboat directly in the middle of the frame? Or would they have looked for some positive space, some energy in the photograph other than just a picture of a sailboat? The rule of thirds comes into play and, and you can see again as a construction element that it's constant in many photographs if you look for it. Talked about positive space and this is another example of this. Again, the, ru the rule of thirds is in play. This is a close up of a botanical uh, flower. Uh, constructed with some positive space in front of the image. Again, if we look at just the image itself, um, we want, I wanted to create uh, a visual effect where you could see the folds of the petals of the flower, the color, uh, the energy. And again, the background is out of focus. Uh, it's part of an effect that you want to soften the image. Negative space. Th th this is a, a, a compositional element where your primary subject maybe is moving away from you or is, is looking away from you. Again, rule of thirds is in play. Uh, we have negative space here behind this uh, ship heading into the shipping channel. But along with this, uh, we have light and dark we have a, a bridge and silhouette, all construction, uh, construction components of a good image uh, that you're trying to relay uh, a, a story to the viewer. Leading lines. Um, one of the basic compositional elements of phot photography or painting or sketching, uh, you, you have these elements within the the structure of the photograph or within nature. Uh, the classical leading line photograph is standing on railroad tracks and, uh, and taking a photograph look, looking down the railroad tracks. In, in this case, I was using constructural elements of, the, of a pier to take this photograph. I waited uh, four days to actually get this image the way I wanted it. Uh, I came there every morning. Uh, and finally got the, the sky to be right, the light on the water to be right. And this woman was taking a walk as she did probably every morning, uh, although I didn't see her until this morning. And, uh, and you, you finally captured the image. The bonus is this uh, boat tail grackle sitting on the end of the, uh, one of the arms of the, of the light. But, uh, but again, Again, using these constructed elements as, as a, a visual effect in your photographs. Uh, this is a bit of digital art that, uh, again, I, I made this photograph at the Carnegie Museum, a picture of Andy Warhol. And uh, again, I used the, uh, the, the hallway itself as a, as a visual leading line. Um, this is a single leading line constructural element. And uh, as a photographer, and it, this goes way back to when I was taking some photography courses in college, uh, 
Uh, I have a very big tendency of bringing in physical elements from the right-hand side of the photograph, and I, I just do. It's just a natural phenomenon. But uh, again, if you let yourself go and take enough pictures, you, you will find some element that, that you resonate with in your, uh, in your visual eye. Um, Finally, this is, an, this is a photograph that uh, kind of brings together a lot of the compositional elements that I was talking about, texture and light and dark. Um, this is a deserted uh, beach scene. This lady rode her bike down, uh, dropped it, uh, laying on the beach, sunning herself. She didn't know she had a photographer for uh, watching her, but, uh, but anyway, uh, I made this photograph uh, and uh, it resonated with me, the, uh, the, the color of the sand, the, the milky sky. It's kind of uh, in between color and black and white. And uh, uh, lo and behold, if you, uh, if you look at the compositional element of it, it's, it's actually a, 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 a almost a perfect resonance of the Fibonacci's ratio, which is a um, mathematical ratio that uh, artists and photographers use in their mind to uh, position uh, components in a photograph that again become naturally pleasing. This is a mathematical formula and it uh, resonates in uh, the DNA helix ocean waves and, and a lot of, uh, of, of, of natural uh, and um, uh, natural phenomena and uh, physical uh, things that are that are in our universe. But anyway, um, I just wanted to point this out that constructing the photograph becomes a uh, an exercise that as a photographer, you can improve yourself uh, by thinking of these kind of components uh, when, when you're out pho pho photographing uh, what, whatever. I want to talk just briefly here at the end about file types and data storage. Um, uh, you've taken a lot of uh, digital photographs and most people don't know what to do with them. Uh, they're, they're generally stored on your computer as JPEG files, which is a, stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. This is a, a, a standard that was developed in the 1980s to uh, handle digital images and primarily digital images. It does not do, as it says here, uh, text or, or anything else. But it's an image that is able to compress files. So. Uh, I don't know if many of you have uh, emailed a photograph and a, and a thing comes up, do you want a large format, medium or small format file? Um, and this JPEG allows you to compress pixels in, in the file image so you can send smaller photographs uh, uh, via email or, or whatever. Um, the smaller pho photographs cannot be blown up. They would then uh, end up being pixelated. Uh, when I put photographs on my website, I put them generally very small, uh, loss, lossy format photographs so that if someone takes it off my website, they're not, not gonna be able to blow it up or do much to it. Uh, uh, Trying to prevent someone from taking something off your website is almost virtually impossible. So um, th this is a, a file format that almost all digital images end up being. Uh, raw files, as a photographer, I shoot all my images in raw file mode, which is not really an image mode. It's a, it's a digital file that is uh, unique to each uh, camera uh, maker. I use Nikon, so all my images are in Nikon raw files. Uh, this allows me to do the most uh, after image making processing in, in the computer. And you need software like Adobe Photoshop or Adobe Lightroom to allow you to view the data as images. And you can edit the data 
it allows me to shoot my images in a more neutral mode. And then I can do the kinds of corrections and color, white balance, uh, 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 contrast, etc., that, that I can I can do do with my images. There is uh, plenty of software available to to do after image making uh, corrections for your photographs. Adobe Lightroom is still the standard, but uh, people are shying away from this as they are uh, totally a pers a subscription service now where you have to pay a monthly fee to use their software. And I'm not sure, I think it's about $150 a year, but you get updates and et cetera and everything. And if you're doing enough work, it, it pays for itself. But there are other softwares that allow you to do the same kind of photo editing. And that's it. Did I hit my time? Pretty close. <laughs> uh, yes, and I was wondering, are there any questions? Tom, I wanted to know on, on the, that orange lily, did you remove the background from it? Let me, uh, this one here. Yeah. So how are you getting the black in the background? Okay. I took this at the Phipps Conservatory. Okay. Um, and um, I'm not, I don't, I don't remember quite what the lighting was, but, but I, I didn't have a lot of light behind the, 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 the okay. image. So I exposed primarily on the center of this of this flower, uh, and again, when I when I look at something like this, um, I don't classify this as macro photography. Some photographers would, I, I do not. Uh, what 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 I what my motivation is to give the viewer uh, a, a more intimate view, a more intimate natural view of the of the flower. Um, I don't do any, uh, you know, softening and some of the other effects that some uh, photographers may, may do, which is fine, but uh, I'm trying to give a natural view of, of, this, of this flower. So, so you didn't, you didn't, Alex, saturate that color or no. anything? Wow. Um, uh, That's beautiful. What I try to bring to you is, is, is what, if you were to get right down you know, next to that flower, this is the kind of, of, of image that you, you would see. Uh, trying to notice the little details, you know, these little, uh, I don't even know what they're called, but, uh, uh, but, but the, delicate, yeah. the delicate folds of, of, the, of the petal, etc. cetera. Um, and again, um, trying to control my depth of field. Now I'm very close to it, so I have a very shallow depth of field anyway, to trying to make the background out of focus, but yet still kind of pleasing to the viewer. Uh, does anybody yeah, know? It, it looks intentional that, you know, because the color pops forward in the black, in the oh, back yeah, it fades. Is, it is intentional. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, uh, you have to work hard at, at understanding that. Uh, does anybody, do the painters know what Boca is? B-O-K-E-H? Boca is the effect of having a pleasing, unfocused background. Sometimes it's referred to as uh, points of light, but it doesn't have to be. So not only does the background, should the background be out of focus in this case, but it shouldn't be such that it distracts from what you're trying to present in the front of the image. Um, let me end this here a second. If I go back to if I go back to this image, uh, this is a natural light portrait, but again, um, I'm 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 fairly. A, a good distance away from her. I'm using a, a, an 85 millimeter lens. So you, you have to be careful to 
I don't want the background to be in focus. That, that would distract from her, uh, her, her image. Uh, but uh, I also have to be careful that I don't want it to be out of focus in a way that, it, again, it just de detracts from, from her. Uh, she's the star of the picture, and I want her to be the star of the picture. So, uh, and uh, you, you have to think about these things in constructing, um, in constructing a photograph. Um, I have a question. Can you hear yes. me? Yep. Um, do you have any particular subject matter that you prefer you really love to do? Um, <laughs> I do an awful lot of flower photography. Um, but um, I would have to say that's uh, a, a been a primary uh, uh, focus of mine. But I tell to be more of a technician than a than you than kind of picking one genre of photography. Um, I I like doing different technical shoots uh, so that it uh, kind of stretches my uh, capabilities in physics primarily. But um, but but I I try to say there isn't a shot I can't do. Whether I do them well or not is another story, because there are many photographers that. That, that focus on a certain element. Uh, I would like to do more portrait photography. I just don't have the opportunity and, and right now to, to do that, but um, uh, th that's a, a big interest to me. But I, I tend to want to do technical shooting and shooting these close-ups of these flowers tends to be very technical uh, in, in trying to get the kind of image that I, that I want. Well, thank you. You are very knowledgeable and I've learned a lot. And uh, if anybody else doesn't have any other questions, we just really would like to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Well, uh, thank you all for listening. <laughs> no, that was, thank you, Tom. I really appreciate, um, I, I think actually, dare I say that we have so much to look at that maybe would have been hard to look at if we were in person, because I was studying your pictures and well, and the, the charts and everything, yeah. Uh, uh, we we could have done the same thing in person, but okay. but, uh, <laughs> but but we expanded our technical ability here tonight to be able to do this. So so this yeah. is, uh, it's been a uh, long time since I've done a, a visual presentation. I've been retired a long time, so. Uh, um, it's, Tom, it's, it's, if you want to, if you want to meet me at Hayne Middle School any day of the week, you can yeah. give all the presentations you want. Okay, there you go. <laughs> now, uh, did we record this presentation? I think we did, didn't we? Yes. Okay. Well, we could put that online for those that oh, missed definitely, it. Definitely. Yeah. We'll. We'll. Uh, it with Thank Tom's you. permission. Can I ask Thank Tom you. a question? Can sure. I ask him a question? Tom, what's your favorite? What's your favorite camera that you like to use? I I'm a, I follow the Nikon God. <laughs> the Nikon. Only, Nikon. Because, only because I've always used Nikon's, and uh, I have a couple different bodies. Uh, I have a, a crop sensor body, a seventy one hundred, and I have a, a D seven fifty. I I like both of them very much. Uh, D seven fifty. Uh, okay. But. Right. Um, but the, the, everybody asked me that too, which camera is best. Uh, but the, today there are the Canon, Nikon, Sony, uh, all make very good cameras. So you have, a, uh, you have your point and shoot already. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but uh, I, I tell people that, you know, once you decide, then, you, then you're kind of stuck with that. Uh, Camera bodies are relatively, uh, they're relatively inexpensive. They really are. Uh, uh, you can get a, a decent uh, Nikon camera body, let's say a 5500 series with a kit lens and a few other doodads for five or six hundred dollars, uh, which is which is pretty cheap and you end up with a pretty powerful, powerful camera. It's the glass that goes on the end that's, that's expensive. Um, 
your kit lenses are a few hundred dollars, but uh, you buy a good prime lens and you're, you're going to spend several thousand dollars for a, for a prime lens. So um, um, good glass, it's simple. Good glass takes better photographs. It, it, it eliminates a lot of the problems that you have in, in photography. But uh, thank you. But I have a question for Tom. Yep. Uh, where do you get your photos developed? Uh, you mean prints made? Okay. Uh, uh, I use a lab in Minnesota called Pro DPI, P R O D P I, and um, they do all my print work. Uh, they're a pretty versatile lab. They do metal prints and fabric prints and all kinds of art paper, whatever you need. Okay. Um, their response time is is pretty quick. I, COVID, it's been a little slower, but I, I don't count, I don't count that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, you download some software uh, from their system. Uh, you have to. You have to sign up as a photographer and uh, you upload your photos through this software. Um, any order over $12 is free shipping by FedEx to me. So, um, and um, their prices for standard prints are, are, are really pretty cheap. So, uh, but I use them for everything. Uh, uh, other than Processing photographs, I do all of my own processing here as far as uh, uh, software. Uh, I use Adobe Lightroom and I use Adobe Elements for processing my photographs. As I said, I shoot everything in RAW format, so, uh, and they're huge files, so I drop them all onto my computer and uh, run them through Lightroom first usually, and then see what I have. Um, it, it's akin to developing a roll of film uh, because I, I'll be out in the field and taking all kinds of photographs, but I really don't know what I have until I look at them in, in the computer, really. So uh, I tend not to take, you know, with digital photography, you can take thousands of photographs before you realize it, but I tend to try not to do that because then you end up with a lot of, uh, of uh, photographs to process. Uh, I talked with a couple wedding photographers. I, I don't do weddings, by the way. They're, I would kill myself first. But anyway, I talked to a couple wedding photographers and they, <laughs> that's pressure shooting. But anyway, uh, th they kind of told me that, that kind of the same thing back a long time ago. Try to shoot as few images as you can because then you have to end up do it right the first time is what they were telling me instead of instead of taking a thousand pictures to get one good one maybe take a hundred to, to get one one good one and that's about the ratio of pictures that i really like that, that i will uh, do something with uh, that's the biggest problem today is i have literally thousands of digital images on this computer, but, but I certainly don't print them all. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a balancing act of what I like to do with them and what I want to do with them. I enjoy, when I did my uh, back hall gallery show, I enjoyed, that was what some of the most images I had printed in a long, long time. So mm -hmm. I forget how many images there were, maybe 30, 35 images or something that I had framed. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so yeah, that's the problem with digital photography is what do you do with all them? So uh, I haven't been doing any photography. I, I, I have 11 slide trays from the 1970s that I'm converting to digital. <laughs> uh, back in the 70s, slides were it. Kodachrome. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, they're 40 years old. Uh, I, you don't <laughs> stop to think about it. But so I bought a, a machine to, to convert them to digital, but they're all discolored and oh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, a, it's a project. So during COVID here, I've been um, imprisoned in here trying to get them. 
I'm through, uh, I'm through six. I have about another five or six to go yet. And there's, there's about 130 slides in a tray, so. Oh um, my God. Yeah, oh my God, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tom, uh, I have a big box from my parents' house of the slides. I, I've just been doing that too, but, you know, with the COVID and everything. Yeah, and I, did, I didn't th really think about it, Jim, that, that they would be, they were aging, that the, whatever the celluloid, whatever it is, and, it, and they're discolored. And yeah. uh, I'm thinking, you know, it's a lucky thing I started doing this because, you know, maybe before too long, there would be not worth saving. And most of them are family photographs and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, but still, um, it's a digital. So I'll end up with, uh, with this great, uh, these uh, 11 digital files of, of each slide tray, you know, so it, it, it works out. So um, I also do some photo uh, restoration. Um, go to my website, there's a gallery of restorations that I like to do. So um, that, that kind of consumes me sometimes too. But again, it's more of a technical aspect of, of photography. Um, I, I know Jim and uh, uh, dabbles in uh, and Debbie dabble in digital art when I I've, I've done a little of that but uh, uh, I don't know <laughs> uh, it, it, well mine is more free form I think I I, I don't know but uh, I'd like to play a little bit more with that also yeah one one of the things I'd like to say I, I pulled up this little point and shoot that that he he noticed. Um, you know, I have a pre-digital SLR, and uh, I know that when I had it, I didn't carry it around as much. So I like having a little point and shoot that I can just carry with me anywhere. anywhere. And, you know, I'm not promoting this. I'm just telling you, it, it kind of depends on what kind of thing you want to photograph. And I do, do, do a lot of... Your, do you use your camera phone? Yes but yeah. I can get far better shots with this one. Exactly. Um, and, and the reason for that is I do a lot of macro photography of okay. more close to macro, you know, of, yep. of yep. Um, natural things. And, you know, my art is jewelry. It's small, shiny okay. objects. Yep. And this one had, it's an underwater camera, which isn't why I bought it, even though I've got moon jellies from the Monterey Bay Aquarium floating around behind me here. But um, uh, it's got a superb macro lens. It has the best little macro lens for a point and shoot that I could find. And so that's why I love it. And that's why I carry it around with me. Because then anytime I want to shoot something, I'll take the photograph as opposed to having to remember to carry the big camera around. Now, I'm not a professional photographer. If I were, for if I were a photographer, I'd look at it differently. But, yeah. you know, as a, as a, as a you know normal human being who just likes to take pictures you know yeah but that, that's uh, my mind is the difference in what your goal is yeah you're specialized see you're, you're mm -hmm. kind of specialized and you're using that for a purpose um mm -hmm. i don't want to date anybody but us older generation people tend to want to carry those around like i said earlier because we go back to having those instamatic cameras those Kodak Instamatic cameras that we carried every place taking photographs. Uh, the younger generation, they pick up one of these. And but, but uh, my phone doesn't have a macro. I mean, I, you know, it's great for landscape kind of well, things. It doesn't it, have a macro, but if you really want to, you can buy an attachment that yeah, will right, yeah. <laughs> to do it. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it lacks versatility. I have, a, I have an app on mine uh, called ProCam, and okay. uh, it allows me to do some different things with software, ba basically. Okay. So mm -hmm. there are third-party apps that you can use that will enhance, uh, the, like if you're using an iPhone, there's a, there's a camera app, and it's, it's pretty basic. Um, okay. uh, the iPhone now has three lenses, but it's still pr pretty basic. But, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, back are, a level but from But there that. are apps you can get that will enhance that, that, that camera. Um, there is a whole genre of photographers that use solely uh, the cameras and phone. I follow a few of them on Instagram, and they take marvelous pictures. Again, they're digital images, so what, what do you do to them, you, you know? There's a guy in Georgia who is a, he delivers propane. 
and he takes pictures all over Georgia out in the boonies, and they're just absolutely marvelous photographs. And uh, but uh, he doesn't print them or anything, or sell them, or do anything with them. But but they but he puts them on Instagram. Thank God, and I love I love looking at them. But uh, uh, but again, these small point and shoot. There's nothing wrong with them. I'm I'm not downplaying them at all. I I had several of them. I've stopped carrying them around. Uh, I've gotten so used to carrying my uh, DSLR around when I when I go shoot that it just doesn't bother me anymore. So. Uh, it's just a matter of taste and preference. Mm -hmm. yep. You're muted. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I agree with I that. Can't I agree. Read with that. <laughs> um, I agree because it, I think it depends on where you go too. I have a Nikon um, 7500, and I have a little Nikon. And I used to love Olympus, by the way. Um, but a point and shoot, but I never ever want to take my expensive camera to the beach and God forbid you get a grain of sand and you've ruined a camera. Yeah. So well, see, I think total, I think totally different about the equipment. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not about the camera at all. Oh, uh, the camera it is because I don't want to buy another one. <laughs> The camera is replaceable. Well, they are expensive, but the camera yeah. is replaceable. It's it's getting the shot that's yeah. that's important. So uh, it's just a matter of perspective. There was a thing on um, B and H B and H uh, mm -hmm. photography in New York City yep. uh, is a camera store. Well, they sell a lot of other. If you're looking for a good camera deal this time of year, go there because they have some kits that are just outstanding. But anyway. They always put something on, you know, what do you think, of, what, what do you do with this? And uh, uh, what, what was the question? Uh, is a camera a member of your family? <laughs> That's what the question was. And I go, what? <laughs> and many people said yes. Many people were saying, yeah, the cam oh, I, I love my camera. And I said, don't get attached to it. Um, I'm an old lifelong road cyclist. I used to race uh, in my youth. And uh, the discredited Lance Armstrong wrote a book called It's Not About the Bike. Well, it's really not about the camera either. It's about you as a photographer or you as a painter or an artist. Whatever you're doing, it's, it's really about you and not what, whatever you're holding in your hand, you know. And um, whether you have a natural eye, um, the, 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 the instructor, when I took the black and white photography course, thought I had a natural eye. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I think it comes with development, shooting more and more photographs and thinking about uh, photography. I read a lot. I read a lot of technical stuff because that was my background. But, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, so, so that part of photography, the physics of light passing through a lens and onto a photo sensor in interests me. So um, th that, that part I like very much. And by the way, my background is, uh, my bio set is infiltration and masks do work. So <laughs> that, that's nickel knowledge. You're <laughs> muted again. Because I'm on it all day long. Thank you, Tom, so much. That was fantastic. I appreciate well, it. Again, if anybody has any questions, uh, I think my information's on the website, uh, and you can reach me through my uh, through my uh, website, 706photography.com. Um, and um, there are several galleries there with, with, with what I like to do, and uh, you know you can contact me through that also.